the next Sunday to Rocky Springs Church and the week after that to Union Church. So we will miss him the next two Sundays, but uh, so happy he's with us today. 146. It's always a joy and pleasure to be here at home. I ask for your continued prayers. Uh, this morning, I ask for your continued prayers as uh, we're on the road trying to preach the wonderful gospel of salvation by grace and grace alone among the Lord's people. I ask for your prayers in general as you know, I take each step here in this journey back in 2000. 19, if you don't know, I told Dad, I said, things have really changed in my life. I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, the glare of the world, just like, phew, Lord, just pull down the, the curtain. I said, I, I don't know if, you know, it means that I'm supposed to get up there and speak a little bit. I, I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you things have changed. And ever since then, it's been a, a journey speaking here once every couple of months to, and back in 2020 and 2021 a couple of times a month and then I started preaching elsewhere among the Lord's people from Chattanooga to North Carolina over in West Tennessee a lot and I was filling in for a church in Rocky Springs for a while uh, and they actually considered me to call me at one point last year uh, and so all these things are, uh, I don't know, I just ask for your prayers. The Lord will have me wherever it's at, whether it's here or abroad, but he'll just continue to be with me to preach the wonderful things, Jesus Christ and him alone. I ask for your, you know, going forward. Uh, Baker told me the other day, he's like, I don't know about this ordination thing, Daddy. He's, I love being here at Bethel. <laughs> He said, this is my home, this is, this is where we're at. Because I, I don't know, so if you ever have a vote anytime soon, where, when and where, how that's gonna be, I, I don't think Baker's gonna get my vote. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one strike against me. <laughs> I do ask for your, your constant prayers. Uh, the Lord's worthy of all praise. He hears the cries of his elect both day and night. So ask for him to also be with us here this morning in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 he says now the God of peace we, he recognizes that God is the God of all peace he's the Prince of Peace Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace we live in a world not so peaceful but here he declares the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd you know, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good
good thing. He doesn't desire the office of a, an easy thing. It's not easy. You know, you, you have to be a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, I can't do this going forward uh, through these years if I'm not in the Bible, rightly dividing the word of truth, being like the Bereans who searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. You know, it takes work. work. It takes effort. If I'm going to read out of the Bible and I'm going to read commentaries on the on the Bible and I'm supposed to be profitable unto the children of God, I've got to be a workman, not being ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's, it's a work. It's not something that's easy. If he desires the office of a bishop, it's a good thing. It's not an easy thing. And that's why I ask for your prayers. That's why any gospel minister asks for your prayers. It's not just to fill time. It's a deep desire that your prayers and things that he has studied and to show himself approved unto God, not to you. He's got, he's got a higher power. He's got the great shepherd of the sheep he has to answer to. He says, the great shepherd of the sheep. He is great. You think it's easy to you know, just get up there, the gospel minister, and talk about how great, how great God is. It's really easy. You know, it's the whole adage is if it, it was easy, everybody would do it. It's not an easy thing. The man of God needs your prayers. Psalms 147 Verse 5, it says, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifted up the meek. He cast the wicked down to the ground. It's a wonderful psalm. In verse 1, he says, Praise ye the Lord, or hallelujah. That's why we come to the house of God to praise the Lord. Say hallelujah and amen to the one who got the job done. He sent forth his son. That's what he said. The God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd. He is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. In John chapter 10, he talks about being the good shepherd of the sheep. He says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. No greater love as any man have this than he lay down his life for his friends. He lays his life down for the sheep. He is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the God of peace. He made peace on the cross of Calvary when he reconciled us back to God. We were enmity against him. He is the God of peace. None can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? What a great shepherd we have. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He goes on down and says, I am, in verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. He knows his sheep. We know God knows everything. He's an omniscient God. That's a great God, an omniscient God. But he knows his sheep. He'll separate the goat from the sheep. He'll put the goats on his left and his sheep on his right. He is a great shepherd. He knows his sheep. He will not forget his sheep. We will not be cast out. We have many of things we do here in this life that we deserve to be cast out. He will not cast out. He knows them. He loves them. He is the good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep. And know my sheep and have known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. And he says, and other sheep I have of the Gentiles. He says, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice. They're going to hear the voice of God. Every elect child of God that comes into this world will hear the voice of the Son of God. You will not hear it audibly, but you'll hear it in regeneration. When he comes into your heart, it's a guarantee. He is the good shepherd and he knows his sheep and they are known of him. He says, I must bring them. There, he has in one shepherd. He says, therefore doth my father love me because I what? I lay down my life. He laid down his life for every elect child of God. It's a done deal. No man take it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. That's a great power from a great God, from a great shepherd who careth for his sheep. He careth for you. He cared enough that he sent his son for you. That's a great shepherd. What a great shepherd we have. You know, David, through all his trials and all the things he did good and all the things he did bad, David was the apple of God's eye, but he understood some things. He said in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. It was personal. He's my shepherd. He's a great shepherd. I shall not want. There was nothing that he lacked 
from this great shepherd who careth for him and bounds up the wounds. He gives sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, preaches the wonderful gospel to the poor. That's a great shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. They're not parched pastures and, you know, dead grass because it ain't rain. He giveth the rain. He giveth the clouds. He giveth us all things. He careth for us. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leaveth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He goes on down to verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Has he not been good to you all the days of your life? You know, dad's going through this house stuff. I've lost a customer, a big customer this week to work. But, I mean, those are little things. Those are just small things. The Lord is a great shepherd. He's taking care of me all the days of my life. We're about to bring in the Lawrence party of six here. He's been with us to this point. He's going to be with me until I draw my last breath, and I'll be with him forevermore because he cares for the sheep, and he will not lose a one. He knows you. He loves you. And one final day, we're going to be with him. He is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's the shepherd. He's the keeper. Ain't nobody taking you out of the hand of God. That's what he says there in, in John chapter 10. He's, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them what? Eternal life. He didn't offer it to you. We would never accept the offer. <laughs> when we're dead and trespasses and sins, you can go to the grave and you can talk to somebody. They ain't going to jump up out of there. You can do whatever you want to. You can make it look real good. You can make it look real nice. You can entice them. If you're dead and trespassing the sinners, you're not going to accept no offer. But he didn't offer. He gave eternal life to all the children of God. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. He told in the high priestly prayer, he says, Thou hast given me power over all flesh, that I should what? Give eternal life to all them that thou hast given me. He didn't offer it. He gave it. He has power over all flesh, and he gives it. He doesn't offer it. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's eternal security of preservation of the saints. You're not taken out of the Father's hand, because he is what? Greater than all. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is great shepherd. He is the great sheep. He is known as the, uh, our great high priest. If you read over in uh, Hebrews chapter 7, he talks about Jesus being our great high priest. You know, the, priest, the high priest in the Old Testament, they offered uh, sacrifices not only for themselves, but for the people. But he is he's a, our great high priest. He is our great shepherd. He goes down in there in Hebrews chapter 7 and says, verse 24, but this man, he wasn't just a man, he was this man. He was the God man. He was the great high priest. You know, they had to have a priest come in. When somebody died, another high priest came in. Another high priest came in. Ever his priesthood is from everlasting to everlasting. It says, but this man, when he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. God is unchanging. He's a God that cannot change. He gives eternal life, and they shall never perish. He continueth forever an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him seeing he ever liveth to make what? Intercession for those. He makes intercession for you and for me. He takes our weekly prayers and meekly prayers, not weekly, I mean daily prayers, but not weak as in like, I'm not strong. He takes our meek and weekly prayers and offers up to a heavenly father, a great high priest, a great shepherd. How wonderful is that? He makes daily intercession for you and for me. When we need it the most, he is there. He is the one that cares for it. He bounds the wounds. If you see yourself lower than the lowest, he is greater than the greatest. And we can come to him for that strength and that power and the wisdom that we stand in need of on a daily basis. What a great shepherd. What a great high priest that made a one offering and sacrifice forever. He hath perfected them forever, them that are sanctified. It wasn't by blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he offered one time in the holy place. That's the one good thing about the Lord. It's by one offering and one sacrifice. It's by one man, Jesus Christ, who got the job done by one, not by many, 
It's a monergistic work. He came, he delivered his people from hell. That's where we were all going if it wasn't for the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the redemption, on the cross. He says, for such a high priest became us. He willingly came down here to be with us, to be us. But what was the difference? He says, he, for such a high priest became us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for that people's. For this he did what? He did it once. He didn't have to do it again and again and again. We have to come to God on a daily basis and he intercedes for us to ask for forgiveness. To ask for forgiveness of what we have done that day, whether we have harmed a brother, whether we've harmed our wife, our sibling, whatever it is, you know, we have to come to the, the great shepherd. But he did, when he did this, he needed to not do it daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins. He didn't have any sins, he was separate. And then for the people, it's where he did this once when he offered up himself. I'm telling you, John, Paul says, for by but one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. God's never lost anybody to suicide. He's never lost anybody to the surgeon. He's never lost anybody who's lost their mind. Here, I hope to keep my mind here. <laughs> For the rest of my life, you know, that wild gallery, and he was, he, he was out of his gourd. <laughs> Nobody even liked to come near him. But he had friends at one time. And the Lord, and his miraculous work, came down as the great shepherd, healed the man in his mind. He went back home praising the Lord. And that's what we should all do once we, the Lord has blessed us and shown us grace in our hearts and turned our stony hearts into a heart of flesh. We should live each day going out and telling our friends what good things the Lord has done for us. We have a great shepherd, great shepherd of the sheep, great high priest. He's just a great God. We talked last week about, uh, or a couple of weeks ago, about the great God. His, you know, his ways and his thoughts are unsearchable. He's just a great God. I just wanted you to come away this morning to look for our great shepherd and the great high priest. We can come to the throne of grace, to that high priest. We can come to him. He careth for you. He careth for me. I appreciate your time this morning. appreciating the message this morning on God's greatness and him being our great shepherd and our great high priest. That's what Paul said in Hebrews chapter 4 to give us encouragement to press forward. He says, seeing we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, let us hold fast our profession. When you're getting weak and weary and kind of like a reed moving back and forth in the wind, just remember you're a great high priest passed into the heavens. And that should stabilize you and strengthen you to continue on in your profession of faith. Now, Brother Tim has been preaching to us on the greatness of God. I want to speak to you on the subject of covetousness. Now, I can see already you're excited about that. I can just see the smiles on your face, and I'll go from the great God of heaven and earth to, to, to covetousness. But hopefully, the Lord will bless this in a way this morning be beneficial to you and honoring to Him. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, we find what the apostle writes and says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, that we may boldly say, The Lord is our helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. 
The word conversation in the Bible usually means your personality, your outlook, your attitude, your overall conduct in life. It goes a lot further than just speech, a lot further than just words. So he says, let your conversation, he's talking about your overall life, be without something. Be without covetousness. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, the Lord Jesus Christ said, beware of covetousness. And he said that right after a man came to him in verses 13 and 14. A man came to him and said, Lord, says, tell my brother to share with me the inheritance. And the Lord said, am I made a judge over you? It's kind of an odd answer, but I think what I learned from this is there was no real perfect answer the Lord gave him because the Lord knew there was greediness and covetousness in their hearts. So he then proceeds on to say, beware of covetousness. So that tells me this is a pretty important subject. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, he says, but let all fornication and uncleanness, all manner of uncleanness and covetousness not be once named among you as become saints. If you believe you're God's child and want to walk in the pathway of discipleship, here's some things that should not be named among you. Fornication, for one, and, and the world glamorizes and glorifies fornication. Fornication is a word, really, that embraces all manner of immoral behavior. All manner of sexual sins is embraced in this word, fornication. He says, don't let that be named among you. All manner of uncleanness, don't let it be named among you. And don't let covetousness be named among you. Now, the first time the word covet or covetousness is used is in Exodus chapter 20. And we have the Ten Commandments. Yes, the Ten Commandments are still in the Bible. They really are. They may be taken out of the post office, all government uh, buildings and schools and all that. But it's still in the Bible. I read it today. I read it yesterday. I read it today. It's still there in Exodus chapter 20 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The last commandment is thou shalt not covet. Now the last commandment and the first commandment have to deal with transgressing God's law inwardly. The middle eight have to do with that which is outward and physical. The first one and the last one deal with that which is inward and is a problem of the heart. The other eight result in what is in the heart. As I said before, the heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. You'd just be amazed how many times the word heart is used in describing the emotions and the feelings and the behavior of people one way or the other, positive and negative. So the last commandment is that of being covetous. Now I actually started to ask you this morning if you had a piece of paper, so I guess I am asking you, a piece of paper and a pen and I'd say, now I want you to write down the Ten Commandments. Do you think you can get all ten? You think you can get all ten down? I imagine some of you would get three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight. Hopefully somebody get ten down. But there are ten of them. And we need to be you know, aware of them and understand what they are. The Lord started off on Mount Sinai giving these Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. In the first one, I shall have no other gods before me. Very short. That deals with the inward. Then it says, I shall not make any graven image of anything in, in, of what is in heaven, on earth, or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them. That's outwards. That's physical, as you see. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, done all the time. Anytime you use the name of the Lord and it doesn't bring honor to him, you use it in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. It's one day out of every seven Honor thy mother and thy father, which is the first commandment we promise, that your days may be long upon the face of this earth. Young folks, listen to me. Here's a commandment that's got a promise with it. If you honor your mother and father biblically as you ought to, the promise is overall, you got the prospect of living a long life here in this world. Okay? Then he says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit fornication, adultery. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not. There are some of the ones more people are more familiar with. He says, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. And then we come to number 10, thou shalt not covet. Now, 
I know parents, good parents, are going to sit their children down from time to time, and they're going to mention some of these Ten Commandments. You know, the Bible says the Ten Commandments, you, you, don't, you don't lie. You don't bear false witness. And the Bible teaches, you know, you don't kill. The Bible teaches, or murder, rather. The Bible teaches that you're not to steal. You're not to lie, et cetera, et cetera. But how many sit down with their children and give them number 10? Thou shalt not covet. The Lord said more about covetousness than he did the other ones I've been mentioning here this morning. It was a sin of covetousness that made the Apostle Paul realize what a sinner he was. You go to Romans chapter 7 and you'll find where Paul is relating his experiences, all the feelings, all the emotions, and everything that he went through after his Damascus Road experience. He didn't go through any of these prior to that, but he did after that. And he said in verse 7, he says, I had not known the law. He said, except that, he said, thou shalt not covet. Now, I won't go into details in that seventh chapter this morning, but basically what Paul is saying right here is after the commandment came, you know, sin revived and I died, it's here that Paul recognized I'm a sinner inwardly. Don't you, you know Paul knew the Ten Commandments backwards and forwards. Paul could write the Ten Commandments out, I'm sure, not miss a one. I'm sure he could quote all the Ten Commandments, but it was when God's commandment of life came to him on the Damascus Road that he saw himself to be a great sinner, and he doesn't list fornication. He doesn't list stealing. He doesn't list lying. He lists the sin of being covetous. That's what made him realize that, hey, I'm a sinner inwardly. I may, you know, when he gives his experience in different places, in the Philippian letter, for example, he speaks about he was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. As touching the law, he was blameless. Paul thought when he was Saul of Tarsus that he kept the law to a jot and a tittle, had every T crossed, every I dotted. But after the Lord arrested him on the Damascus Road, he showed him what a great sinner that he was. He lists the tenth sin here, the tenth commandment of God, thou shalt not covet, as the one that stirred his mind, stirred his heart, and made him realize, hey, I can sin inwardly as well as outwardly. The Lord taught these lessons in the Sermon on the Mount. Come to Matthew chapter 6. He says, you have heard it, heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yes, that's one of the Ten Commandments. He said, but I say unto you, if a man look upon a woman and lusteth after her in his own heart, and lust after her, he's committed adultery in his own heart. He says, you've heard, you sh thou shalt not kill. He said, but I say unto you, if a man is angry with his brother without a cause, he's in danger of the council. As you hear the Lord equates being mad, angry, angry without a cause. Somebody says, did not the Lord become angry? He did. When he drove the money changers out of the temple, he was angry. The Bible says he was, but it wasn't without a cause. If thou art angry with thy brother without a cause, then you're in danger of the council. He takes anger with a brother without a cause and, and murder, he puts them on the same level. So the Apostle Paul uses this 10th commandment here in explaining his experience in Romans chapter 7. Now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 20, Mark 10, and Luke 19, you're going to find a story about a man we refer to as the rich young ruler. And when you put all three of these together, you find where this young man come running and he knelt down at the feet of Jesus Christ and dressed him as master. He says, Master, what good thing shall I do? Good master, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? In his mind, there had to be some good thing that he could do that he would inherit eternal life and come to the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him as good master. The Lord then asked him a question. Why callest thou me good? There's only one good, and that is God. Now, there's a lesson for us on man's depravity. I have, how many times you've heard people say in your lifetime, well, there's a little bit of good in everybody. That, that is not true. That is absolutely not true. And to the Lord born you in the Spirit of God, there's nothing good inside of you. Trust me. <laughs> That's not true. I, I, they got it way outside the Bible. <laughs> Left of Genesis, right of Revelation. They didn't get it in the 66 books, I can guarantee you that. So the Lord is saying, why callest thou me good? There's just one good, and that is God. Do you recognize me as the Son of God, God manifest in the flesh? You know, he never really got an answer to that. The Lord just asked him that. And he says, thou knowest the commandments. And then the Lord gives him commandment number six, seven, eight, and nine. And then commandment five. That's the way he did it. 
He didn't give him commandment 10. And the rich young ruler says, well, I've, I've observed and kept all these from my youth up. He was a confident young man, wasn't he? Now, we know he had wealth, we know he had power, and he had, uh, you know, authority, and he had youth. And, and as I've said before, you may have youth today, but come back in 30, 40 years and tell me you still got youth. You will lose youth if you live out a normal lifetime. You will lose youth, okay? <laughs> so don't get so caught in about that. You know, sometimes I, I, it just really gets me when I hear some young person disrespect an older person and call them old man, old woman. The very thing they hope to be one day. They hope to be an old man, old woman one day, and they show such disrespect in calling people like that. So, he gives them these commandments. He says, I observed these from my youth up. I don't know how old the man was, but he's pretty confident. And then the Lord told him this. He says, well, you, you lack one thing. He said, well, well, let me know what it is. <laughs> he says, go and sell all thou hast and distribute and give to the poor and come and follow me and ye shall have treasure in heaven. Now, he's not talking about eternal heaven here. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven here. So he says, go and sell what thou hast. What did the young man do? The Bible says he went away very sorrowful because he had great possessions. He'd accumulated a lot. This, this man here didn't understand what the Lord taught back earlier in Luke chapter 12, that a man's life consisted not in the things which he possesses. That's not where your life is at. Your life is not in more money. Your life is not in material possessions. It's not in a, a newer house, a newer car, and all these kind of things, and newer clothes. That's not where your life is. Your life is... Your life is in things that money cannot buy. And when a person becomes so obsessed with things that money can buy, he will lose the things that money cannot buy, which are the most important things. Those are the real treasures in life. What did the man do? The man went away very sorrowful. He come to the right man. Uh, the, why he asked this particular question, uh, I don't know in particular, but that was, what was his understanding? He thought that was some good thing. But the Lord showed him here that there was no good thing he could do he could not keep the law in total perfection. I think that's what he had in mind. He kept this one, this one, this one, this one. The Lord said, we lack one. The Lord withheld number 10 on purpose. He gave him here the commandment of being covetous. This young man apparently had exercised covetousness in times past. He had accumulated a lot of things. He was very rich, but he went away very sorrowful. I believe his sorrow was in proportion to the riches he had. He was not willing to do what the Lord Jesus Christ said. But here is a statement that Mark makes. Matthew and Luke do not, but it's very important. The, the Bible says the Lord beholding him loved him. And the reason I emphasize that is because there are some people who teach this lesson to God's people and show that this man fell short of doing something to obtain eternal life. He went away and wound up being lost. But I can tell you he was not lost eternally because Jesus loved him. Here's one of God's little children come to the Lord. The Lord loved him. He, he's mixed up up here all right about certain things. And the Lord showed him he could not keep the law of God in perfection. Therefore, there was no good thing he could do to inherit eternal life. But if he wanted to have joy in the kingdom, he needed to sell what he had, distribute it to the poor, and come and follow me. And that shall have treasure in the kingdom of God here. Behold, the Lord loved him. I can assure you, if the Lord loved him, he was one of his. If the Lord loved him, he was an heir of promise, a joint heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord loved him, he was an elect child of grace, elect child of God. But he went away sharp, but he didn't go away happy. He came to the right man who always has the right answers. I've never taken anything to the Lord and got a wrong answer. Have you? <laughs> you never will. The answer the Lord gives you will always be the right answer. He gave him the right answer. And the disciples were standing by watching all this, listening to all of this. And the man went away. That just left the Lord and the disciples and they were astonished at what they just heard and the lessons that just the Lord had just taught this man. And they were amazed. If this rich young ruler couldn't do something to be saved, then how can a man be saved? And the Lord explained this to him. He said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Then he explained it further. He says, those that trust in riches. 
So the difference in having riches and trusting in riches, you see. He says, for easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's not talking about eternal heaven. He's talking about the joys of God's kingdom in this earth. Now explain the kingdom of heaven like this, or the kingdom of God. There is always, when it comes to a bank, there's always headquarters for the main office. And then they have many branches. And you may go to a branch here and a branch there, but you haven't gotten to the main office. The main office of God's people is heaven. The branches of this is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. This man went away sorrowful because he was guilty of being covetous. And it cost him great joy that he could have had if he had just done what the Lord told him to do. But he couldn't bring himself to separate himself from it. He couldn't bring himself to part from these material possessions that he had accumulated. One thing that young folks need to learn when you get a job, start making money. I'm along with Dave Ramsey on this. I was with this before I even heard about Dave Ramsey. When you start making money, you've got to do something with it. And some people, yeah, spend it. <laughs> spend it. Well, you've got to spend some of it for sure. You've got to pay bills. You've got obligations, responsibilities. But you need to also set aside a certain amount to save. And you always need to set aside a certain amount to give to the Lord's church, the Lord's kingdom here. That's three things you need to divide your money up when you begin to budget it. Now you may have seen mom and daddy put money in that collection plate over the years. That's great. Now you start working, you need to follow suit. <laughs> they set forth the great example, you see. This man went away very sorrowful because he wasn't willing to do what the Lord told him. He couldn't bring himself to separate himself from these material possessions. Now we come over to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And here's where the Lord said, Beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not of the things in which he possesses. He said there was a rich man. Now when you read the book of Luke, watch out for the rich man in Luke. Luke specializes in speaking about the rich. Now he's not putting the rich down. Abraham was a wealthy man. Isaac and Jacob and David and Solomon. All these were very wealthy individuals. Job was a very wealthy man. But they knew where it came from and they used it good and they used it properly and they honored God with it. But riches can be a hindrance if you're not careful. It can be a real hindrance to you. Remember he said, be content with such things that you have. You look in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Here's what Paul told Timothy. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness, godly living, add contentment to it, that's great gain. He said, for we came in this world with nothing, and we're going to leave with nothing. Everybody understands the first part of that. Everybody understands we come in this with nothing. But some people don't understand you're going to go out with nothing. <laughs> you're going out just like you came in. And once you've had in between, the Lord just blessed you with it. And the Lord gave it to you to properly use as a good steward. Put these things in your hand to use them in a proper, in a godly manner, in a godly way. He says, therefore, having food and raiment, let us be content. Food and raiment represent necessities, do they not? In Philippians 4.11, Paul says, I've learned of whatever state I'm in to be content. Here's something he learned. He didn't, he didn't inherit this. By nature, we're covetous. By nature. He learned to be content. So he said, here's a rich man. And he was a very, apparently a very successful farmer. And he had a great crop. And so he, he, he had a problem with wealth. <laughs> Now, some people say, I'd love to have a problem with wealth. No, you don't. No, you don't. This man had a problem with wealth. Let's see how it turned out. He's, the Bible's going to record everything he said in a way to find a solution to his problem with wealth. It's 66 words. The personal pronoun in there is used 11 times. God's name is used zero times. He never mentions God. He never mentions anybody, any individual. All he mentions himself. Eleven times he mentions himself. He said, what am I going to do? He says, oh, I've got it. I I'm just going to build me bigger barns. The ones I've got now are not large enough to hold all this, so I'll just build bigger ones that can hold all this. Then I'll just tear the other ones down. So he's, he's come up with a 66-word plan that doesn't involve God or anybody else. 
This man was deceived on two fronts. He believed that a good life was based upon the accumulation of things. Wrong. He believed that death was far off. In this case, he's going to be wrong. He said, I'll build new barns and I'll put all this into these new barns. Then I'll say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry for years to come. And the Lord called him a fool. He says, thou fool, this day thy life is required of thee. And then who shall all these things be? So shall it be for all those who are rich toward themselves and not rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich toward God? I believe it means that you honor God, that you thank God, that you recognize that God is great, that you recognize the blessings of God that's come into your life. You recognize every bite of food that you eat is because God has blessed you to have it. You recognize every suit of clothes you put on, every pair of pants, every shirt, every dress, every pair of shoes that you put on, God's blessed you to be able to do it. It means that wife sitting beside you, that husband sitting beside you, those children and grandchildren that's right there, God has given them to you. You recognize it and you honor him for it and you praise him for it and you glorify his name for it. You set aside those things that might hinder you in the house of God and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and you fill your seat here to sing praises unto him. That's being rich toward God. You pray and you thank God every single day. I've said before that you pray, you pray at least five times every day, at least five. When you get up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, if you eat three times, you pray three times at every meal, that's a total of five times that you talk to God in prayer, thanking him and being rich toward God. <coughs> so easy to take so many things for granted, isn't it? So easy to take the sunshine and the rain. So, so easy to take uh, the uh, accessibility of food. You just go to the grocery store and you buy all the buy ones, get one free. That's what I do. <laughs> So people make a grocery list. Mine is buy one, get one free. I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes I like to play the game. Brother Siles Ford, uh, name he's called it, Cart Don't Stop. He goes shopping with his wife and at a grocery store. He, he, he has a cart. It don't stop. Every time it stops, it costs him money. <laughs> so you've got to put it in fast. Cart don't stop. That's not a bad game to play. You come out with a lesser bill at the end. Anyway, <laughs> this man was deceived on these two fronts. He said, Thou fool, this day thy life shall be required, and then whose things shall these all these things be? We come over to the Old Testament. And in the book of Joshua, chapter 6 and chapter 7 is a lesson that clearly exemplifies what we're talking about here this morning. We find in chapter 6 where God has told Joshua that he's given him the city of Jericho, given him the king and all the men of valor. And then he gives him all these instructions and we find in verse 18 where he says, Thou shalt not touch the accursed thing. The accursed thing was anything anybody touched and took away from there because everything, all the spoils was to go to God and go to the house of God and into the temple. Everything. No one was to take anything for themselves. So God blessed them. They conquered the city of Jericho. That wonderful story of, you know, how they marched around the city seven times uh, on the seventh day, you know, and, and the walls fell flat and they're sky high and they're rejoicing. And then the next uh, city for them to approach is a city called Ai. And it had far fewer people, didn't have great walls or anything else. And so their battle plan was, well, we don't have to send the whole army. We'll just send a few up here, a few thousand to take care of that. They went and they got defeated. Oh, this disturbed Joshua greatly. And he went to the Lord with it. And the Lord revealed unto him that somebody had taken of the accursed thing. And until that person was identified and dealt with, they would never win another battle. That's a lesson also to show how God... And his plan defeated the great city in Jericho, but the children of Israel without God couldn't defeat just a few people in the city of Ai. So we find where Joshua does some inquiring. And Joshua did some investigating. I'm skipping a lot of stuff here. Did some investigating. And lo and behold, finds out there's a man by the name of Achan, or Achan, A-C-H-A-N. 
there's a guilty party. And here's what he said. He says, I have sinned. He says, when we took the city, he says, I saw. Now notice, I saw, because covetous always begins with eyesight. I saw a goodly Babylonian garment. And I saw X amount of shekels of silver. And a wedge of gold that weighed 50 shekels uh, in weight. He says, I saw, I coveted, and I took. Notice the, the steps. I saw, I coveted, and I took. He didn't think anybody knew, and they didn't, but God did. God knew all the time who it was. But Joshua and him investigated and found who it was. Let me tell you what the price was for doing that. The children of Israel lost many, many men in that battle of Ai because God withdrew his presence. Then Achan and his family were all slain. Don't think you live on an island by yourself. Everything you do affects other people. You'd just be surprised how many people your actions affect in life. Notice all here. Men, people died as a result of him looking, coveting, and taking, and trespassing against God, taking the accursed thing. When Joshua determined who it was, the situation was taken care of, and they all lost their life, then they went to, up to Ai, and they fought, and they won the battle. We look over here in 1 Kings chapter 21. In 1 Kings chapter 21, you're going to find a man who's the king by the name of Ahab, who's one of the most wicked people you'll ever read about. He's one, probably the worst king Israel ever had. And one day he looks over to the side and he sees a vineyard that belongs to a man by the name of Naboth. And he says to Naboth, he says, I want, I want your vineyard. He says, I'm, I'm back from you. Or oh, I'll just trade you. I, I got another vineyard. It's better than your vineyard. I'll just swap with you and you'll have a better vineyard. But Naboth says, no, it's not for sale, it's not for trade. You know why? Because when God had Israel settle in the land of Canaan, every tribe got an inheritance. It was important for everybody in that tribe, all the families belong to that tribe, to keep what God had given unto them for an inheritance, to keep it in the family name. That vineyard didn't belong to Ahab, it belonged to Naboth. In one sense, it didn't belong to Naboth, it belonged to God. Naboth was an honorable man. He says, no. But she will have, he's got a wicked wife. It's, it's not surprising this wicked man would have a wicked wife and her name is Jezebel. You know, I've said this before, brother. The Lord blessed us with four children. We named them all biblical names. David, Timothy, Mark, and Sarah. When you look at the people we named them out from the Bible, these are all commendable people, right? I would never name a son Ahab. I would never name a daughter Jezebel. He may have a good reign to it, but I can guarantee it doesn't. You wouldn't name somebody just because they're in the Bible. You wouldn't name your child that. So Ahab and Jezebel, they're a team. I'm telling you, they're a wicked team. And Jezebel says, well, here's what we'll do. Says, you're the king. It didn't matter if he was the king. It didn't belong to him. But see, he coveted it. Now, this is a common practice among the wicked. Remember what I said in the beginning, Ephesians 5, 3, don't let it once be named among you as become a saints. She made up an official lie that Naboth had blasphemed God, which he had not. False charge. She put it on official stationery and sealed it with the official king's ring and got false witnesses to testify that Naboth had blasphemed that God's name. And so they brought the charge against him, found him guilty based on the charge of the, of the false witnesses. He was slain, and after he was slain, Ahab takes possession of the vineyard. You know what happened to Ahab? The Lord prophesied unto Ahab and told him in the very place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, the dogs are going to lick the very blood of Ahab. He's going to be slain. He's going to run out of the chariot, and the dogs are going to lick it up. Came to pass just like the Lord said. He lost his life. Jezebel lost her life. Go read the details of her, of her, her death, and what took place. 
I want to uh, I want to go back to our opening text for a moment. Now the Lord said in uh, in uh, Exodus chapter twenty verse seventeen concerning thou shalt not covet. Let me give you the details of that just for a moment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife his men servants, his maid servants, his ox and his ass, or anything else, don't covet it. Well, covetousness begins with a look. And generally speaking, somebody guilty of covetousness winds up breaking several other God's Ten Commandments. Ahab did. He looked over at that vineyard. He coveted that vineyard. He had a man killed to get that vineyard. A very wicked man. So we find the judgment is placed upon them here. All right, let not covetous be once named among you. Now I'm going to go back to Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, he's talking about, when he says he, he's talking about God. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now when did God say that? Well, he said it more than once. We go back to the book of Genesis, hundreds and hundreds of years before, and God is dealing with a man by the name of Jacob. Jacob's been on the run from his brother Esau. God appears to him in the night when he's in the desert land, the waste howling wilderness. And the Lord appears to him in a dream. He sees a ladder going right up into heaven from this earth. And there's a voice that spake to him. It says, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac. And the very land you're laying on right now shall be your land and that of your uh, descendants, etc. He says, uh, I, am, I am your God. And I won't be your God. I am your God. He says, uh, uh, I will deliver you. I will lead you. And I will not forsake you until all these things have passed. I will not forsake you. What's our text say? For he has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. And God never did forsake Jacob, did he? Blessed him all the days of his life. Then to be 147 years old. Finally saw his son Joseph in the land of Egypt and his grandsons. And one thing I just blessed him immeasurably. When he died, Joseph took his body out of the land of Egypt, took it back to the land of Canaan and buried him among his fathers just like he desired, just like he wanted. God never left him nor forsook him. Then we come over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13, uh, 31 verses 5 and 6. And we find Moses in his last days telling the children of Israel, when you cross over Jordan, Joshua shall lead you, and God shall bless you to possess the land, to obtain the land, for he will not fail you nor forsake you. That's the second time he said it. And then I come to a third time in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, and the Lord is speaking directly and specifically to Joshua. And he says to Joshua, he says, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. Now that's a handful right there, isn't it? Because Joshua had been right beside Moses for years down in Egypt, the 40 years in the wilderness. Now Moses has died and God has buried him and God has chosen Joshua to walk in his footsteps. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. No man can stand before you. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will never fail you nor forsake you. It's the third time he said. So what's our text say? Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things you have. For he has said, God has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So what am I to understand by that? If God has promised he's not going to leave me, if God has promised he's not going to forsake me, and I put my trust in God and depend upon God, I should have no desire to covet things that belong to somebody else. Everything I have is sufficient for me. God will be my sufficiency. And he says that we may boldly say, now we can boldly say something based upon what God has said. God has said, I'll never leave you. I'll never, forget, uh, I'll never uh, forsake you. And in the Old Testament example, we got the used expression, I'll never fail you. So my question to you is this today. Has God ever forsaken you? Has God ever failed you? Has God ever left you? If I was asked for a show of hands, I'd be totally shocked if I saw somebody raise it. 
Has he ever left you? Has he ever forsaken you? Has he ever failed you? If you don't think I've been calling on God's promises in the last few months, <laughs> all these verses, my friends, have come to my mind and I'm holding on to them. <laughs> I'm just grabbing hold of fight as I can. Lord, I know you promised not to leave me. I know you promised not to, for, uh, uh, to forsake me. I know you promised not to fail me. I know you promised uh, if I seek first the kingdom of God, these things will be added to you. I know you promised me all these things. You never let me down. There's never been a time when you failed me. But Lord, I need you now. I need you now. That I might boldly say the Lord is my help. And I will not fear what men shall do to me. Do you see the, you see the flow? Do you, you see the understanding of this? Do you see how your conversation should be without covetousness? And be content with such things as you have? For he has said, this is not some relative who said something. This is God said it. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And based upon what he has said, I can boldly say, the Lord is my help.